Who's our great? Um, so good morning, everyone. I'm Stacey Valender. I'm a, a family physician and medical director of the Evaluation Sciences Unit. Um, today, I'm excited to, to bring to you Barbara Mayer. Uh, she is director of the, uh, the Evidence-Based Practice Center, which we'll, we'll hear about today. Um, she's also, oh, sorry, I misspoke, executive director of the Professional Practice and Clinical Improvement for Stanford Healthcare. I think that's her operational title. Um, she also founded the Evidence-Based Practice Center and serves as the director of that. And what that is, is it provides consultation, education, and tools designed to ensure safe quality nursing practice that aligns with the best available evidence. Um, she also serves as a clinical assistant professor in the School of Medicine. Um, she works with the Resident Safety Council and also the unit-based medical directors to identify opportunities for improvement. Um, it's just incredible to have a nursing leader so active in our institution. Um, she has her university, sorry, her PhD in nursing from the University of San Diego. Um, she has her RN, of course, and we're um, we're just so excited to to hear from you, Barbara. So with that, I will let Barbara take it over. All right, I'm going to see if I can't share my screen here. There we go. All right. Well, thank you, Stacey, for that lovely introduction. Um, makes, makes me sound a, a lot more um, important than I think I am, but I'm happy to be here and talking about the Evidence-Based Practice Center. Um, this has been a, a dream of mine um, for a while now. I've been at Stanford for about 10 years, and um, the last couple of years, we're really starting to see this uh, come to fruition. So without uh, any additional uh, fanfare, I'm just going to go ahead and talk about the center a little bit. But first, um, just some background on evidence-based practice. I, I know we're all fairly familiar with that. It's been around for a while. Um, you know, the studies do show that if we base our practice on empirical evidence, uh, we can manage some of the variations um, in our care that lead to errors. Um, and um, missed or inappropriate interventions are reduced. So we end up with better patient outcomes, um, safer, more efficient care, reducing our costs um, to care for those patients, um, optimal use um, of our resources, and really more individualized patient care. The evolution of evidence-based practice, you know, it's been around for, you know, about 30 years now or so. Um, back in the, in the 90s, um, started with uh, the folks at McMaster's University. Um, Dr. Gott um, coined the term initially. Um, Cochrane came into being um, the, with the um, advent of the Cochrane collaboration. Um, then Dr. Sackett defined the definition of evidence-based practice um, nationally here in the States, the AHRQ and IOM um, began to recognize the benefits of evidence-based practice, named it as a core competency in the early 2000s. Um, you can see from the graph in, in the lower part of that slide, um, the progression of publications related to evidence-based practice has grown dramatically since that time. And just a, a quick search of the term EBP or evidence-based practice um, came back with almost 9 million uh, publications um, dated from the 90s um, to today. So still a lot of interest um, in evidence-based practice and how we're using it. This is the first definition um, that Sackett came up with. And um, you can see here that the focus was on um, utilizing the expertise of the clinician, as well as um, combining that with external clinical evidence. Um, since then, um, we've refined that definition a bit even more and taken a patient-centered approach to it by including patient preferences. And so what we end up with is 
um, this equation for evidence-based practice, which is our best available evidence, um, the clinician expertise based on education experience and clinical skills, as well as the patient's values and, and the circumstances that the patient um, is in at the time. And then also the newest piece of this is, is the context, the care location, where, where we're actually providing that care and what the resources are that we have available um, to meet the needs of that patient based on the evidence and our own expertise. So in looking at nursing practice um, here um, at Stanford, as well as in general, um, we find that you know, our, our practice is often based on tradition rather than evidence. And there's a lot of reasons for that. We hear things like, you know, well, everyone does it this way, or, you know, it's just how we do things here at Stanford. Um, and then, of course, the world famous one of we've always done it that way. But further than that, um, nurses are great innovators and um, find workarounds when they encounter barriers to doing things um, that they need to get done for their patients. And so, you know, it may not be that it's available on the unit. We have it, but it's not stocked on the cart and I don't have time to wait for it. So I'm going to find a different way to, to get where I need to go. Um, this is frequently what we hear, you know, I really don't have time for that. Or this is just an easier way to do that. And those all create variations then in, in our practice, which lead to some of those errors that I mentioned earlier. So having said that and, and realized that about my own practice as well as um, the practice of my colleagues, I went to the literature to find out, you know, what, what's happening? What are the barriers to evidence implementation? And you can see on the slide that, you know, we're talking about resources, um, clinician time, um, having a general understanding of what it means to, to use evidence-based practice. Um, not having the skills um, or the tools to implement it in a, a, an organized fashion. Um, the organization may or may not see it as a priority and um, leadership has um, different focuses and may not um, necessarily be providing the support that we need to make that happen. So at the same time, I looked at what are the characteristics then of, of an EBP environment, an environment that then promotes evidence-based practice. And it's, it's really presenting a, a culture where, you know, it's okay to ask questions. It's okay to ask why we do what we do. That EBP is a core competency, um, leaders role model and, and support um, the grassroots, the, the bedside clinicians, um, to uh, utilize evidence-based practice. Um, importantly, that there's a shared mental model and there's a, a standard process for implementation. Um, there's education that you know, helps people understand what a EVP really is and how to use it. And we have coaching and support um, for uh, those nurses, um, those clinicians that want to um, implement evidence-based practice um, in, into their own practice. Um, another key part is that we're disseminating and providing those opportunities within the organization to share what we, we're learning. Um, and the, the last thing is around resources is um, in addition to having tools and a framework, having some experts that um, can serve as coaches, um, clinical nurse specialists and um, a nurse scientist to help us with the, um, the rigor that we want to put into this process. So as part of my ACES project, um, which is, uh, was a, a wonderful timing for me in, in building uh, the Evidence-Based Practice Center, um, I did a gap analysis of what our, our current practice is. And what I found from the things in the literature that said, you know, if you have these things, you have a, a really good chance of being a, a supportive evidence-based practice culture is having an executive leader who um, definitely supported this quest for evidence-based practice and also the opportunity for dissemination. Being a magnet organization, that's a requirement for us um, to 
present and um, share our quality improvement and evidence-based practice um, and research projects. So those were things that were kind of built in already. There were a few things that we had that um, we could do better in. Um, one was this idea of a culture of inquiry. With our shared governance structure, um, we have staff nurses that are included and involved in making decisions about clinical practice here at Stanford. And so um, that was one way to promote this culture of inquiry. We also had um, ongoing implementation projects that our frontline clinical practice teams um, were carrying out, and we were well aware of the organizational priorities and trying to marry those two things together. Um, again, being a magnet organization, um, the involvement of our clinical practice team, um, our bedside clinicians, um, is a requirement for us for um, redesignation. Re and then we have a wonderful group of um, clinical nurse specialists. We have about 20 of them that cover all of our different specialties um, across the organization. And um, I'm also fortunate enough to have um, a, a partner in all of this now, and that's Mary Law, um, our nurse scientist, um, who's our implementation specialist. And um, so those are things that, while are in place, um, can certainly um, we can do a, a bit better in, in building those and strengthening them. The things that were missing and what really was the impetus for the center is we really didn't have a model um, or a, a standard process for implementing evidence-based practice. We use the PDSA and, and the um, IHI model for improvement, but it was a little bit haphazard. There's some lean elements um, that were um, kind of on the periphery for us and um, other tools and, and processes that um, people were using in different situations. So we didn't really have any structure around um, evidence-based practice. Um, it, we didn't have any education specific to what it is and how to do it. And um, so, you know, we, we weren't really seeing a, a core competency among um, our nursing um, colleagues. So enter the ACES program and um, the project that I put forward there was um, creating a structure and some processes to really facilitate um, as well as oversee adoption of evidence-based practices in um, the organization. Okay. So over time, um, things have evolved um, since the early days, and right now we're, the center is um, the evidence-based practice center here at Stanford um, for nursing, and the goals of the center um, remain intact from the very beginning, and that was to ensure excellence um, in our nursing practice, to provide support um, in the way of, of structures, some processes, some tools um, to help our bedside staff in evaluating their own practice um, identifying where the gaps are um, and implementing um, the evidence um, that's available to them. Um, and we really wanted to do all of that using an implementation science approach. So from an administrative standpoint, um, the center itself lives within the professional practice and clinical improvement department. Um, some of you may know it more as uh, nursing practice and quality. That's the uh, colloquial term for, for our department. Um, and so that's where the center lives. Um, as the executive director, um, I am also the director of the Evidence-Based Practice Center. And um, we developed um, a, a governance board um, so that we would have some oversight, um, a group that um, could look at what we were doing and planning for the center and provide some direction there. So the governing board is um, clinical experts, operational leaders, bedside staff. Um, we have a, a physician liaison um, that um, also uh, works with us on the governance board, um, Dr. Nira Huja. And we're really at this point looking to set some direction, some policy and some priorities um, for the center um, as we go forward from these um, initial steps. 
So back to the um, ideas that were in the literature around um, what is an evidence-based organization, um, culture plays a, a huge role in that. And I mentioned our shared governance councils and our uh, unit level um, and bedside level involvement in making clinical decisions um, for nursing at Stanford about our practice and, um, and how we deliver that care. Um, we also have uh, embedded um, the evidence-based practice language and principles in some of our key documents. For example, our policies and procedures um, are managed by um, the practice side of my department and the nursing um, clinical nurse specialists are um, the owners of those policies and ensure that they are based on the latest um, best evidence that's available when we review and revise them. Um, we're also working with the nursing leadership to provide them um, the education um, around evidence-based practice and the resources that we are now offering around that through the center. And um, they've been wonderful in supporting uh, their staff in participating in some of our programs. This is the model that I created for evidence-based practice. And one of the things that I wanted to do is make sure that it incorporated the other types of models that we have that guide our practice. So when you look at this model, the, the center of it with the interlocking circles is the evidence, the clinician, and the patient, the three components of evidence-based practice. And the triangle around it um, is how we're going to utilize the implementation science principles um, for dissemination and sustainability as we move forward with the different projects that, that we're working towards. Around that, you'll see some other concepts and principles that we use um, to guide practice. One is the caring science concepts um, up from Gene Watson's theory, um, which guides our practice, ethical principles of quality improvement and practice, certainly magnet, which drives a lot of the quality improvement knowledge um, acquisition that we do um, within the organization and our own professional practice model. And then the outside ring talks a bit about some of those things that um, influence our practice um, from um, an internal and an external perspective our professional organizations, um, culture, the environment, um, new evidence that comes about, um, guidelines and resources that come from um, our regulatory um, and legal um, colleagues as well. So trying to embody that in, in a model that gives a nod to those things in, in relationship to evidence-based practice. Um, the other thing I created was the process um, implementation framework. And this has undergone a, a tremendous uh, evolution since the very first uh, framework um, as we've evolved um, some of our um, educational um, groups and, and projects um, have come to fruition. The um, framework itself um, utilizes the uh, evidence-based practice process, that's the, the first box that you see there, which is all about, you know, what is it that we're trying to do? What's the question that we're trying to solve for? Finding the evidence, appraising the evidence, and then um, assessing and synthesizing the evidence um, and comparing it to what we're currently doing, identifying that practice gap, and making a recommendation for where we need to go next. And then the second half of the framework is the, the action steps. That's the, the PDSA portion of implementation. And it's developing the plan going forward based on our literature review um, and the evidence that we found um, and then utilizing those practice gaps that we've identified to build a plan uh, to make whatever practice change or improvement um, we want to make. Um, and then the end result is looking at the data that we get from that implementation phase and determining where we need to go from there um, if we need to make additional tweaks to that evidence um, to fit the context or the patient population that we have 
taking in that third um, concept within the evidence-based practice equation. Um, and then making sure that we're sustaining and disseminating the evidence and, and, our, and the results of, of the work that we're doing. At the bottom of the framework, um, from the toolkit that we put together, um, we've tried to map the tools to the different steps within the framework. And the purpose of the framework is really to provide kind of a step-by-step -step guide um, so that we don't miss any of the steps um, in the process and come out the other end with a very um, concrete, sustainable uh, um, outcome. We took a little bit of time to look at roles and responsibilities as well in, in our teams related to um, evidence-based practice. You know, first there's the leadership team um, who really are in the promotion phase. You know, they, they are providing um, and, and ensuring that we have resources available, that the center has a strategic plan that is aligned with the organizational strategic plan. And, um, and they provide the support um, for um, myself and, and the governance team to move the center forward. The EVP coaches are facilitators. There are experts, um, they mentor others. They also serve as faculty in our training programs. And um, they also then will contribute to developing um, the strategic um, initiatives that will move forward in the um, center itself. The clinical nurses um, need to really understand the evidence-based practice model and embrace the concept of clinical inquiry, um, questioning their practice, bringing those questions to the forefront so that we can um, prioritize them within the center and um, develop the projects to improve our practice. And then we're gonna talk a bit more in just a second about our um, evidence-based practice fellowship program, um, but these are um, a specific group of individuals that support evidence-based practice through evidence implementation. And once they complete the fellowship, you know, we ask that they you know, serve as our, our cheerleaders and our, our um, messengers out to the rest of the, the group um, around the concepts of evidence-based practice. They mentor their colleagues um, about evidence-based practice, can serve in, in as um, coaches and project leaders for additional evidence-based practice projects. Um, and just really all around um, join us in, in our quest for um, improving our practice via evidence. Alrighty. Can't get this to go forward. There we go. All right, so here are some of the resources that um, we have created or are creating. Um, we have a website of sorts, um, but it's not very informative right now, so it's under construction. But the idea is to provide a, a one-stop shop where they can find um, resources, apply for the fellowship, um, ask for assistance with an EVP project, um, attend a class, gain information, access the toolkit, um, all of the things that we'll have available um, on that website. We do have a toolkit and um, the toolkits, toolkit has templates and um, instructions on how to use those templates um, to get you through the implementation process. And then we have our coaching and consultation with our clinical nurse specialists, as well as our nursing quality um, coordinators and our nursing quality team. Um, and they provide assistance with projects, developing PICO questions, literature searches, implementation, planning, and execution. Um, they have served as well um, as our CNSs, um, as coaches for um, some of our evidence-based practice projects. Another um, resource that we're just putting into place is um, Ovid Synthesis. It's a software program that walks you through um, a, and documents all of the, the parts and pieces of, a, of an EBP project, including um, the project background, 
um, how it aligns strategically, um, literature searching, literature um, review, developing evidence tables, um, summarizing the findings and, and walking through the actual um, implementation phase, the sustainability and dissemination, um, creating abstracts as well as PowerPoint presentations um, or posters. And part of this software is a, a dashboard that you can see on the lower part of the screen that once we get the project's input into um, the, the Ovid synthesis itself, we'll be able to track progress um, and see who's working on what and where we are um, in the process. It's a way for us to track um, what's happening from a quality improvement evidence-based practice perspective um, within the department and um, provide assistance where it's needed and document the work that is going on. A couple of the ev evidence-based education programs that we have, um, one is the nurse residency program. This is a 12-month uh, residency where all new graduate nurses um, that come to work at Stanford um, go through this program. And um, we have about 20 hours of didactic content and experiential training that we do with them um, throughout this 12-month period. And they come out the other end having done a literature search, a review, um, a synthesis of the evidence, and a recommendation for a practice change. And the topics are curated by our practice um, and education team based on our quality um, improvement metrics and our practice gaps that we've already identified so that we can keep things aligned. And um, these projects will go into Ovid Synthesis. We'll track them. The reviews will be available um, for uh, implementation when um, we could put those into um, that phase of the framework. The second program that we have is the EBP Fellowship Program. And um, we're calling this the, the Science Fellowship or the Stanford Champions for Implementation and Evaluation of Nursing Care Evidence, which is much too long to say, so we just say the fellowship. Um, but this is a, an eight month fellowship um, with individual uh, coaching for um, a, a nurse who is um, putting an implementation project together. And they walk through the framework from beginning um, to end, actually implementing their project on their unit um, and then possibly beyond um, their unit as well. Um, they have to be a clinical nurse within um, the organization for at least a year. Um, they have to attend all of the um, didactic uh, and experiential training sessions that we have and um, agree to present their project during Nurses Week in May um, at the end of the fellowship. Um, and it's been a, a really exciting time for us. We're on getting ready to start our third cohort next month. And um, it's been a learning opportunity for us as well as for them. As far as where we are um, today uh, with our program participation, um, we've had um, so far the two EBP fellowship cohorts um, with um, five participants so far and five projects. Uh, we've had three N NRP or nurse residency cohorts um, getting ready to start our fourth. These are very large groups of individuals, a total of 246 participants in the residency program. We break them up into groups of anywhere from two to six or seven um, to work on joint projects. And from those three cohorts, we've come up with um, 40 different projects um, that have culminated in the, the literature search and um, recommendation. These are some examples of project topics that are coming out of uh, both the fellowship and the, evident, the uh, NRP. Um, things like using pictograms, improving patient recall of their discharge medication administration times, and looking at um, making those first visits for our um, hepatic cancer patients in the clinic 
um, more appropriate and more um, beneficial for them and more efficient. Um, reducing number of peripheral IV insertions affecting our, our patient uh, satisfaction and comfort um, through the use of the standard algorithm. Um, I won't read all these, you can, you can see them, um, but they're, they're varied, um, but they are tied all to um, observations that have come from um, our bedside or point of care clinicians um, on gaps that they see in our practice. And in the future, um, we're, we're gonna do a, a more work on formalizing our process for practice evaluation and peer review so that we can better pinpoint where our gaps in practice are and, and guide um, the, the work that we're doing in, in the realm of evidence-based practice. Um, we'll continue to refine both the model and, and the framework as, as we learn more. Um, we also want to, be able to offer some of these services um, to Tri-Valley. And um, we've already had some of our outpatient clinics um, participating in the fellowship. Um, that, that happened a little sooner than we thought, but it's been extremely successful for us. Uh, we wanna build an educational portfolio um, that addresses the manager's role in evidence-based practice um, and, and some of the supporting um, skills that you need in order to um, do an evidence-based practice project um, and um, understand implementation science as well. Outside of nursing, the fellowship program at some point will expand to our other um, support disciplines and um, certainly building that robust website to make it easier for folks to find us and find the tools. Um, it's, it's not, um, uh, without expenses, the program. So we are looking at some philanthropic funding um, to make sure that we can sustain the center and the programs that, that we're building. So we're really excited about um, where the, the center is going and, and how quickly things have, have really um, blossomed for us. And I just am really appreciative of being able to report to this group and, and provide this presentation um, on where we are with the center. And I think I made my 30 minutes, Lisa, and, I, and if there are questions, I'm happy to answer them um, or provide any clarity um, for anybody that has um, questions for me. Wow, this is just awesome, Dr. Mayer. Uh, you guys are really, really busy over there. <laughs> and I'm really glad we had you because I, um, I think this group certainly needs to hear what's going on. Um, so folks, feel free to put your questions in the chat. Um, I might call on you. Uh, and if, if you put a question in the chat, if you don't want me to call on you, just say text only or something in your question. Um, but I will kick us off because I have actually myself a number of questions. Um, I, I, it's really, it's, it's really, um, I've been thinking about nurses and they're great innovators with the workarounds, but then there's also this thing you talked about, which is, well, we've always done it that way, or it's just how we do things here. Um, and then I was thinking about that in conjunction with the implementation framework that you put up, uh, that you built, the evidence-based practice process, followed by the PDSA, you guys continue to refine. What, what do you think is the hardest part for nurse trainees? Like what, what is like their, you know, what are they good at in that whole framework process? And what are they kind of like needing more work? I think the, the hardest part is, is time, is, is finding dedicated time um, outside of clinical practice. Um, and and I, I think we can all um, relate to that. It's, it's one of the reasons why with the fellowship, we built in um, dedicated time for them to, to work on their project um, and, and bring that to their department or to their unit. Um, that, that's one of the logistical pieces that's difficult. The other, the other side of, of that, as far as, as difficulty goes, I, I think is, or let me start with what they're really good at, and that is identifying where the needs are. Um, the, the nursing staff, you know, is, is very adept at seeing where there are gaps 
and where we can make improvements. So I think that that's probably the, the greatest strength uh, in relation to evidence-based practice. Um, but because nurses are problem solvers, um, we tend to jump to solutions uh, before we have all the answers yet. And so if, if there was a, a more difficult part here, I would say it's slowing down just enough to take a look at what the evidence says um, so that we don't keep finding ourselves in, in the process of um, utilizing just our experiences. Yeah, we have um, the same thing in, in <laughs> all the other parts of medicine, jumping to solutions. Uh, myself, my colleagues know I am guilty as well um, of doing that. So we're, we tend to say the ideas out loud and we put it in a bookmark in the corner. It's like, okay, you can write that idea down, but we're going to go through this process first. So I definitely um, agree with that and recommend that process to, to folks to actually go to the evidence. Um, we have a question in the chat from Ginger Cell. Um, Ginger, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Hi, thank you, Dr. Mayer. I had a quick question for you. Are you and the team able to quantify in dollars what significant contributions evidence-based projects are saving the organization? Because I think with that, you'd be able to get funding from everyone. Yeah, yeah. thank you for that question, Ginger. It, it's a great one, and it, it's certainly on our agenda. Um, return on investment is, is always difficult in, in nursing in particular um, because we're so tied with um, the bundling of healthcare costs. So um, at this point, our, our projects are have not been as um, long, the sustainability piece, since we've just gotten started, we don't have that kind of data yet, but it is definitely a part of what we want to look at. And we're just having that conversation yesterday with um, both the folks from Walters Kluwer who make the Ovid synthesis um, program, they're building in a module um, to uh, calculate ROI. And so we're going to be testing that for them. So definitely on our radar. Super, thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, great. We have, um, we have a question from Katie Brown Johnson. Do you want to ask the question, Katie? Sure. Yeah. Thank you so much for this overview. It's, it's, um, evidence of so much work that you've done. And so I, I have a big question um, and I'm just wondering like overall, you know, what do you think has been the most effective thing that you've done in terms of changing culture or pushing culture towards um, evidence-based practice approaches and quality improvement implementation science? That's the big question. And then if you have time and you wanna talk about magnet components, I just didn't know what that was and I could look it up. But if you've got the short and sweet, I'd, I'd love to hear more. Sure, Katie, happy to, happy to give it a whirl. Um, as far as changing culture, um, persistence and, and just, you know, being, um, being there to answer the questions and taking every opportunity to talk about um, evidence-based practice and, and what the benefits are. You know, I, I, we still get the, um, the kind of the downsides is that people think of evidence-based practice and, and back to the, the old, well, you know, cookbook medicine and, you know, all of those terms that um, we lived with for, for a little while um, until we, you know, bring out the, the newest definitions and really talk about what it is that, that we're trying to accomplish. And so I think that's been helpful. And um, having the, the support certainly of, of Dale as our CNO, um, you know, he takes every opportunity um, when I'm not there, um, and even when I am to, to bring about you know, talking about evidence-based practice and, and why it's important. So I, I think it's it's a, a couple of those um, elements that, that have really helped us to, to change um, our thinking a little bit. Um, as far as magnet goes, the, the general um, reason for or um, purpose of magnet designation is to ensure nursing excellence. And so they look at things like the, um, education of your staff, 
the um, ability for the staff to participate and be empowered in making practice changes and, and being able to govern their own practice. Um, they, you know, all the technical things around staffing um, models and, and staffing ratios and things like that. But, it, but it's really about providing um, nursing the opportunity to, to govern themselves and their practice. Great, thank you so much. It's sure, nice to hear you. like per persistence and leadership support as kind of the, the main pieces. I mean, that's that's stuff we know for culture, but it's always good to hear what's working for other people. So thank you. And I realized um, I had missed a question above, so I just reposted it, um, Richard Jordan's question. Richard, if, if you're there, feel free to unmute and ask it. Yeah, yeah, a great presentation. <laughs> I started trying to teach evidence-based medicine back in the 90s as a staff physician uh, in, a, in an academic hospital. And it's sometimes a little hard to get people on board to do that. Question for you. One of the challenges that I've seen through the years is when you do a literature review, like I recently did one, I was starting to write a paper, and like, you know, 4,000, 40,000, actually the first run through uh, Medline, and PubMed, uh, 222,000 articles dropped out. You know, of course, then you start applying the filters. And I got it down to about 3,500 articles. And, you know, I'm still trying to talk the team into, okay, how can we engage to, to now you know, uh, review these? And I'd heard about it uh, 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 using AI, uh, um, an online AI program. I think it's actually called Pico, where the team can actually get in and, and using artificial intelligence, you can actually eliminate a lot of articles based on how you write the, the you know your your prompts. And I was wondering, are you, are you using that at all, or is there a tool that you would recommend to uh, help people, uh, you know, eliminate <laughs> some of the redundancy of a lot of the articles that you run into? Yeah. Wow. What a great question. Um, I I I feel where you're coming from. Um, I I hadn't heard of the the AI yet, um, but it sounds fascinating. Um, our projects are a, a bit smaller in scope. And, and so the, the number of articles that, that come out of the, the review of the literature is, is probably a lot less than, than what um, you're describing. So we haven't had, we, we've been using um, a tool based on um, the Joanna Briggs, Cochran, and um, Johns Hopkins okay. tools. Okay, to yeah, I, I'm familiar with those. Okay. Yeah, I was just wondering if you had even heard anything about these. Initially, I thought it was this article was not going to have that big of a scope, but it turned out to be a whole lot more than... It, it's was. amazing when you get into the into the literature. <laughs> you end up chewing off a lot and didn't even yeah. know about it. So Thanks. sometimes I'm not seen for days. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I can hear you. It's kind of fun those those lit review rabbit holes though I I tend yes. to enjoy those myself um, yeah and if anybody has anything to add on that on AI helping with lit reviews um, feel free to put it in the chat because um, I'm sure I'm sure everybody would be interested um, I was really interested Barbara in, in the in what you're doing with the Ovid synthesis uh, you're you guys are still building it but it looks like I went to the the website and I can put it, this is like a, a Walter Kluwer, so the makers of up to date. Um, and there's no, I'm trying to put it in the chat. Um, what, what made you guys decide that you needed like a formal, uh, like formal so to purchase software, I guess, or to, to pay for that service? Um, yeah. yeah. And then like how it's working so far, I think you're still building it. And I've also, I didn't know this existed, but I was thinking that something like this should exist some time ago because we've had, um, Lisa, I know with SMCI, we've had conversations even years ago when it was first forming around like, how are we going to track projects and, you know, and, and then, sorry, uh, uh, the big challenge is how to get people to update their projects over time. So they might do an initial submission, but then how do we know what the end results were? Yeah, I, the... All of those were why we wanted to find something to, to electronic to be able to track. Um, initially, when we were 
looking at the evidence-based practice center, we were partnering with the Joanna Briggs um, Institute out of Adelaide um, in Australia, which is a, a big nursing um, center for evidence-based practice. And um, we found down the road that they really didn't fit with what, what our outcome, expected outcomes were. And so we, we um, went a different direction, but they had some software um, similar to the Ovid synthesis. It was called Summary. And it basically walked you through the steps as well um, in a um, systematic review. And having seen that, um, it, I thought, you know, this is a, a great tool. And so came back um, from there trying to figure out how to, how to develop a, a way to um, do something like that um, to help shepherd people through the process as well as to track um, those projects and, and what phase they were in at some given point in time. And so not being very successful um, in building my own program because I'm not a programmer, um, we discovered the Ovid Synthesis program. And when I saw what it was capable of doing, um, it was almost exactly what we were trying to build ourselves. So, and there's nothing else out there like it um, at this point. So, um, with the advent of, of that, um, it's also customizable so we can take our framework and build the steps, individual steps of the framework into the templates that they have in the software itself. Um, so we can stay true, true to that um, and, and really have an opportunity to one, um, track those projects to um, see, you know, what impact we are having on the organization, you know, the time and, and effort that's being spent on quality improvement, evidence-based practice um, projects, um, you know, are we making progress? Are we having outcomes? And we'll be able to see that in the dashboard as well as um, in the software itself. So that, that was the impetus for, for going that direction. And we are in the middle of building it as, as we speak building those templates. Oh, I'd be curious six months from now, one year from now, what you think. So <laughs> oh happy to happy to come back and, and share that. We're we're very excited um, at the prospect of, of what we're hoping this this is going to do for us. Um, and I see some some side AI chat um, in the comments. Katie, do you want to elaborate on the pro program you found? Yeah, yeah. I, I had been looking for some um, programs to do some AI, large language model assisted um, literature reviews and have been trying out SCIT. It's S-C-I-T-E. It's the assistant like beta version. Um, and um, I'm not vouching for how well it works, except that if there's a gap in the literature, it does really strange things which makes sense because it's based on large language models. And if there's not language around something, but it like apologizes and then makes up weird stuff. And anyway, it's a, uh, it's been an interesting starting point. Um, not the only thing I would rely on for a full literature review, obviously. Yeah. Fun, fun to explore these new tools. Um, so we, we often end 10 minutes beforehand. We've, we've reached that point. If there are any other burning questions, put them in the chat now. So we can... I don't have a burning question, Stacey, but I was just going to, for a second, elaborate on something Barbara mentioned. So as part of our, uh, Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute Health System Implementation Initiative, PCORI, HSII, uh, we have money where we are collecting all these or, or many, many different tools. And, you know, Barbara's center and her tools are among the systems tools we're inventorying. So perhaps at this lecture series, as we have uh, advances in, in the progress of that effort, we can update you. But all that to say, another great reason to join SMCI, to look at our website and uh, look at the tools, because we're our goal is to as many tools as we can make open access to the world, we're going to try to build those and put those on the website. So more to come on that. 
that's it from me, Stacy. Thanks. Yep. Awesome. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Barbara Mayer. It was wonderful to have you. Um, and uh, I'm sure people can find you through the Stanford email sources um, or email Lisa or I um, to get your contact info if people have further questions. Uh, Absolutely. Thank you for, for having me and happy to, to answer any questions offline. Um, always available via text and email. Great. All right. Take care, everyone. Thanks for joining today. Have a Thank great you. rest of your day.